thank you for inviting me uh, to, do, to this uh, wonderful workshop. Uh, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the supernumerary limbs, and we focus on uh, some of the new uh, control framework we call the voluntary uh, reactive control, and some of the cognitive uh, issues. Uh, so, um, yeah, we've been working on the super limbs. Um, yeah, uh, supernumerary is very difficult to pronounce it, so we just uh, uh, you know, simplify the super limbs. That's uh, what we call. Um, so uh, there are many uh, places uh, the uh, human uh, uh, the robot can be attached uh, to uh, augment the human functionality. Um, uh, we started with the waist uh, and then shoulder and uh, wrist uh, um, and then uh, actually chest. Uh, the many places. Uh, our most uh, uh, recent works are something shown here, which I focus on. So, so Superlim is the third type of uh, wearable robots, uh, you know, uh, unlike exoskeletons, ex um, it is to add the new limbs. And so it's free to move. Um, but I know the challenge is control and uh, communications. Despite uh, the potentials, you know, uh, diverse functionality it can create, but, uh, you know, uh, control and communication is a central piece. So in that, uh, I shared interest with this group. So I just briefly talk about the, um, yeah, the overview and then just did a few of the you know, previous works and then focus on the control the communication issue, reactive, implicit control, voluntary, explicit control. And then some cognitive workload, uh, I uh, believe that the Tamer worked on this you know, quite extensively. So we started with the uh, very you know, uh, practical application that was actually the um, uh, final assembly aircraft, uh, um, a big aircraft like this, and then people working on the uh, you know, uh, seating so, or floor you know, all day long. Uh, so we uh, tried to reduce the workload, uh, holding the staff uh, on the shoulder and at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, robotics researchers are developing ways to add an extra pair of arms to your body. The robot will try to act according to what I'm doing. Robotic arms come to life thanks to artificial intelligence. system monitors the wearer's arm movements and eye trackers detect where the person is looking. From this data, it predicts the next movement of the wearer and automatically moves the robotic arms to a supporting position. No explicit human input is needed. The more you use the device, the more accurate the movements become as the AI system learns the way the wearer moves. The next area of research, adding extra fingers. Okay, so that's good enough. So yeah, here, you know, uh, the techniques that we employed is a leader follower approach. So two guys actually teaching how to coordinate their actions. And so this lead person's uh, hand motions is measured with the IMU. And then second person, the follower, is graph the um, supernames uh, and then uh, teach how to coordinate the actions. We take the data and then extract the kind of control algorithms behind it and then transfer that to the robot. And we set the uh, summer time windows over the uh, lead uh, human's uh, hand motions with the IMU. And then uh, this is to uh, use for predicting the desired uh, robot motion, which has been shown by the, uh, the demonstrations of the second uh, the humans, and that that's actually A to D or F uh, robot motions. And then uh, we applied the so-called uh, uh, partial uh, least squared regressions, uh, a little better method than you know, principal component analysis, and then just a few modes that can explain the most of the data. And this is the first mode. Uh, as a human move this and robot move this, that's a kind of a synergistic actions. And this is the third mode. Um, it's a little tricky mode, but I know uh, these are, uh, this can be as, um, treated as a bio artificial synergy, two plus two, you know, four limbs uh, um, coordination can be done. 
So as you have, uh, you know, a few, you know, representative modes, uh, we can create the uh, desired emotions uh, on, as a linear combination of the this, right? So uh, as you move the, uh, you know, uh, arms, and then uh, the robot comes in, and then comes into this based on the, um, the, the three modes. So that's actually one application in the areas, and then representing one type of uh, control algorithms. Uh, let me just introduce another interesting uh, application. So this one happened during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, and then we see the uh, you know big increase of the e-commerce, and then the question is how you deliver this stuff to your home, and then the guys are holding the you know, large box in both hands and the BZ. And having a trouble in opening the door. And here we have uh, super limbs uh, attached to the uh, uh, this my students, and uh, actually he controlled this. this. This video is kind of entertaining. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, please uh, see how he is controlling and communicating with the robot. So uh, both hands are busy, and then uh, um, actually, uh, you know, he. You know, the robot has a um, few degrees of freedom, uh, the simple ones, and then going to the elevator room. And I do not recommend this, but I know it is possible. Yeah, you can do it safely with the robot hand, stop it, and then push the button, which you don't have to touch the stuff, but I know robot to touches. Um, and then move to... Uh, Okay, so can you find how he communicated with the robots? But both hands are busy, they're like uh, holding these tools and uh, this box, uh, right? Uh, so he has to apply some force. Uh, um, but you know, force uh, distributions of forces among uh, 10 fingers, uh, you can actually change that, right? So it is like uh, communicating by actually uh, changing the, the, you know, um, the force distribution among the 10 fingers. And there's a lot of the null, null space, null space through which you can communicate with it. So just I showed the two types of uh, communication controls. One is sort of a manual control, we call that the voluntary control. And, uh, uh, but the problem is that the robot has many degrees of freedom. In this case, it's just a three DOF that's easy, but I know um, having many degrees of freedom, it is actually uh, difficult to uh, do because of so much you know, uh, cognitive workload. So uh, the, here we actually control the robots uh, based on the human uh, measurement. And so reactive controls come in. It's a type of uh, autonomy. Um, but the robot can coordinate its actions uh, with the human autonomy, which is good. However, um, if all the DOF are completely autonomous, the human has no means to directly express his heart intentions, right? So in some way, we need to uh, combine these two voluntary control and a reactive control to kind of balance uh, between the manual control and autonomy must be established. And the voluntary control and reactive control must be integrated in a in nice way. And then, and then looking at the uh, use of uh, uh, this robot um, and then just uh, and having a mini, the, having uh, say a six freedom. And how can we divide the 6DOF robot motion into voluntary control subspace and the reactive control subspace? And the reactive control subspace autonomous uh, the control they needed. How we really, really do that? And uh, that's the uh, issues that we look at. And uh, this is the brand new stuff that we just uh, uh, presented uh, uh, at this in the ICRA. And uh, uh, we particularly focus on the uh, support for hemiplegic uh, the patient, like uh, um, a stroke survivor. The one side of the body is uh, not functional. So they have a, a difficulty in, in doing the bimanual um, you know, operations. 
um, like using a, a knife and a fork. So here we replace the knife side, which is actually disabled the hand by the supari. So the question is how you coordinate the knife and the fork, one human arms, one uh, robotic arms, right? So what we did was uh, the data-driven you know, approach. We took the measurement from healthy uh, human subject and then, and, and then analyze the data, but mostly correlation analysis, and then ident identify on uh, which um, DOF uh, should be uh, voluntary control and uh, uh, which subspace is to be a reactive uh, control, autonomous control. So uh, this is the equipment uh, we uh, developed, uh, and we instrumented the knife and the forks, and then uh, actually uh, you know keep track of the stuff, and then mostly cutting operations you know, like this, uh, you know turkey breast is being cut. So uh, first we did the simple com principal component analysis. It reveals that uh, most of the, the data can be explained, you know, covariance matrix can be explained uh, with just uh, three modes. And then B1, B2, B3 explained the 94% of the data. So now the you know, question is how really we do this. And then our principle is that uh, um, assign a human and a robot to uh, the freedom based on the predictability. So assign, you know, most of predictable degrees of freedom to robot the DOF and the reactive, uh, or, you know, we, we, we can call it implicit control, most of predictable. Um, and assign the least predictable DOF to a human DOF, or voluntary or explicit control. And uh, um, the reason is that the least predictable the DOF uh, and looking at the data, we found in many cases, the humans move to these DOF voluntarily or independently. So he has or she has uh, some particular reasons uh, why he or she wants to move things in that particular way. So that should be, so that actually makes the correlation pretty bad. It, it does not actually you know, uh, correlate with any other motions like a uh, uh, folk motion. So that is to be uh, left to uh, uh, a human um, voluntary control. And uh, predictability is uh, evaluated in this way. Uh, we uh, measure the both knife and the fork motions. And uh, you know, uh, the knife motion is to be predicted based on the fork motions and the other uh, available information and the predictor and, 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 and this predicted uh, uh, motions is to be compared to, against the, um, the grossest you know, ground the truth, uh, healthy person to knife motions, and then prediction error is to be used as the prediction, um, you know, uh, performance. Um, and it turns out that the, uh, I said that, the, you know, three uh, principal components are good enough to represent the, uh, the knife motions. In fact, uh, you know, if you combine one and a two, um, and then, uh, you know, um, um, and look at the predictability, that actually gives the highest uh, and a score in terms of the R square. If you uh, combine the V3 with the V2, uh, you know, for instance, uh, it's pretty poor in predictability, which means that the V3 is very much you know, independent. So this, this should be uh, assigned to a voluntary control. So to summarize this, uh, V1, V2 are assigned to a robot DOF uh, in an autonomous control, and the V3 is to be controlled uh, um, by the human voluntarily. And based on that, uh, we uh, design uh, this, this actual analysis uh, result inform how the design should be. Um, in fact, the, uh, um, yeah, the robot DOF are actually uh, motion is created by actuators in here. And uh, voluntary uh, control, we use the human um, body movement, some part uh, which uh, we can move, um, we transmit that uh, an motion through this uh, the cable, uh, both in cable, to the axis which is to be moved, uh, um, at V3 uh, component, which is assigned to, um, yeah, uh, voluntary control. It turns out that this you know, V3 component, it's mostly a reciprocal, reciprocating uh, cutting motions and when to start cutting and stop cutting, and then whether or not you want to cut here and there, it's basically a human discretion, and that should be you know, done with the voluntary uh, control. 
And this um, video is to uh, just to show, um, yeah, this you know, system overview is, you know, the hand is not actually used here. And then, and then this um, supernames is replacing that. Um, and then um, human motion is created by this uh, foot motions and transmitted to this. And then this uh, reaches the uh, particular DOF of this knife motion, which is a voluntary motion. Um, and then coordinating these two, we can actually express this on our intentions at the same time, the, uh, the knife fork uh, could be created, uh, motions created. Uh, yeah, let me just say this again. Yeah, so, so as, um, as you uh, move this one to other place, it goes together. Yeah, so as uh, the knife is basically follow um, the you know, fork. Yeah, maybe that's good enough. So just a quick summary that actually, you know, just as I said, you know, that, that's a summary. Um, and uh, um, yeah, this is actually a good, uh, Based on the data, we can actually uh, even the structure the robot uh, to meet that one. I think if I have uh, five more minutes, I'd like to uh, you know, discuss uh, very briefly some of the cognitive workload uh, issues. Uh, I remember I had the uh, you know interesting conversation with uh, 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 Tamer they were uh, making some time ago, uh, and then she said, you know, "Can the brain support the superlings?" And can the human control the natural limbs and super limbs simultaneously? Well, what is the cognitive limit? The brain has been occupied the food very busy, and is there any room for the super limbs to have some kind of uh, footprint in here? How can the wearer get to uh, perceive the super limbs as part of uh, his hard body? So we did some uh, you know, quick uh, human subject test. Uh, um, and here uh, we have a very simple you know, pair of uh, uh, super limbs, uh, one DOF motion here and here. And uh, um, um, the, uh, the human is directed to follow these, uh, you know, target which moves and up and down. And uh, with the both uh, uh, natural arms, as well as the, uh, the you know, super limbs have to follow, this guy has to follow this, so this guy has to follow this, okay? And then uh, uh, we use a very simple controls uh, using the, uh, some of the abdominal uh, muscles, uh, we take a uh, AMG and then uh, send a, uh, create the uh, command to activate uh, these uh, limbs. And uh, these muscles uh, do not have uh, uh, interference with the motions of the um, two natural arms. So here, here's the uh, kind of experiment. Uh, so um, yeah, you know, uh, he is pointing at this guy and uh, this guy, and then this arm is to uh, follow uh, this target. And then this, you know, super name is to follow this, and this this one is pointing at this one. So uh, four targets uh, are actually uh, changing simultaneously. And then uh, you know we look at the uh, performance. It follows uh, fairly well. Uh, we both the robot, the uh, left hand, you know, right hand, and then human uh, arms are moving fairly well. But uh, here's an interesting uh, point. Uh, um, so we had all complete uh, time trajectories, right? And then uh, we actually. Uh, uh, put the two two out of four, making some combination to two out of four, and then plot it. So in this case, uh, natural arm one, and then natural arm two, x y coordinate. And then you see the motion is most uh, mostly uh, oblique direction, meaning that the left arm, the right arm of the natural human uh, arms moving all together, right? And um, you know, two of the uh, robot arms are also moving uh, fairly together. But uh, if you combine, uh, look at the uh, combination of, be between the human arms and the robotic arms. So, you know, these four cases shows a very strictly different uh, um, yeah, uh, patterns uh, uh, from the left hand side. Most of the uh, trajectories are horizontal or vertical, meaning that when uh, uh, super limbs are moving, you know, natural, natural arms are not moving, and vice versa. 
So uh, we can conclude that the robot arms and the natural arms do not move at the same time. Uh, there's some kind of a time sharing and happening, right? Human uh, looks at the uh, natural arms and the robot arms back and forth, back and forth, right? But I know interesting point is not just the visual feedback. You know, we do see the kind of a haptic feedback uh, you know, having a very important uh, uh, footprint here. So unlike the robot sitting on the floor, uh, super names are attached to the human. So uh, as shown here, the robot is holding uh, this big structure. The force here is transmitted uh, to the shoulder of this worker. So uh, even though he is not looking at this point, but then he got the sense that uh, it's being held by this you know, robot. Um, so that is kind of a you know, nice way of getting um, information. A direct haptic feedback uh, may reduce the visual cognitive load uh, of the human. So uh, we uh, uh, frame that uh, we have both actual haptic feedback and the visual feedback. And then we did the, the simple experiment, uh, um, uh, you know, having a, 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 you know, a simple, just a one DOF uh, uh, arm, you know, which is uh, pushing the, uh, the table. Reaction force is sensed through uh, this you know, harness, you know, acting on the human body and then a human can detect the uh, contact uh, with the floor and then uh, even the you know, force you know, in that. And actually a human is requested to adjust this uh, force. And at the same time, uh, we provided some uh, visual um, interventions and then doing some uh, games over here. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, he is to uh, control uh, the, this you know, uh, you know, pressure. And uh, interestingly, just uh, focusing on the haptic uh, work only versus uh, haptic plus visual um, you know, interventions, um, there's not much difference between the two. Um, if you look at the only the visual task, uh, you know, there's uh, some kind of difference between the visual only and then haptic plus vision. There's uh, some uh, degradation over here, but, uh, but the point is that not much different. And also detecting uh, some uh, you know, contact, uh, for instance, in this case, uh, he's looking at the, his hand, uh, not looking at the uh, robot uh, you know, uh, supporting this, but you know, he should uh, feel that actually something is you know, um, acting here, right? So we provided the, the subtle signals here and then whether or not the, that, that kind of a, a change is to be detected. We again compared just haptic only and the haptic plus actually visual interventions and again, not much difference. So, so we conclude that uh, there is no statistically uh, meaningful difference uh, in performance between, you know, simultaneous haptic plus visual tasks and haptic task alone. So visual and haptic feedback uh, can coexist and then function simultaneously. So primary task is going to uh, vision, but a secondary task uh, through uh, haptics and that can watch out this process uh, you know, continually. So just to make the uh, you know, quick summary, the human uh, can possess the fifth and the sixth limbs. The super limbs are practically useful, I guess. And the super limbs are opened up the new directions of human robot uh, interactions. And the controlling extra limbs uh, simultaneously with the natural limbs is challenging. Yeah, you know, so you can show the time sharing uh, uh, work, but a direct haptic feedback is an interesting part because the robot is attached to the human body. And then, um, well, and before that, I talk about the robot autonomy. I can reduce the human workload uh, based on the leader follower approach or you know hybrid uh, voluntary you know uh, reactive control. So that's it's my team and uh, my sponsor. And that's it. Thank you so much. And sorry, I know my confusion about the time. That's it. Thank you so much. No worry at all for the for the timing. So um, I see here a question for you, and I think that that, that this question is uh, highly related to the last part of the of your talk about the supernumeral limbs. Uh, you said that natural arm and extra arm uh, do not move at the same time, and it is possible. And, and it is possible to have both of them. And actually the, the extra arms, the extra limbs are useful. And uh, uh, Shopping Bai is asking something related. He's asking if there is some interference with, between human arms and robotic arms in general. Right. 
So, um, someone to asking questions? Uh, yes, exactly. This que the question was: there is some um, some interference between human and robotic arm. Yeah. Okay, in general. So yeah, so sorry, I missed the uh, all previous uh, talks, uh, so I was unable to uh, make a connection to, to uh, the, this uh, session. So, uh, but uh, and, uh, do you have any specific questions uh, on, on that? Yes, this uh, um, Xiaoping Bai, this oh. attendee, oh. Uh, is asking, uh, is, uh, is saying very interesting work, and is asking if there is any possible issue of interference between human arm and robotic arms. Oh, oh, oh I mean, oh, okay, thank you. So, so of course, you know, the workspace is to be must be shared the, the, by two parties, right? The two parties, right? So, you know, uh, of course, uh, co coordination is needed. Coordination needed. There are many types, you know. So, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, if the totally, uh, you know, if. Uh, the one one thing of which we found is very interesting uh, is actually uh, you know the um, yeah hemiplegic uh, patient support the, 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 that work uh, um, well um, you know you know autonomy is basically designed to follow react to the uh, uh, human motions right human motions so by design and then cont by control design. Um, yeah, you know, we uh, actually showed the, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, effective coordinations, and so um, as far as that the demonstration data uh, is effective, we can actually exclude the situations where the two arms are fighting each other. But um, yeah, you know, if something a new situation happens, uh, we don't know, right? So that's actually uh, you know interesting questions. I've never thought, thought about in you know, a situation so where are the uh, natural arms and then uh, and robotic arms are fighting each other, <laughs> but that, that, that may happen uh, because the uh, workspace is to be shared. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for the answer. Uh, Serena raises. Uh, yes. Rana. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, so uh, in slide 41, there was a nice uh, representation of your device uh, and you were talking about haptic feedback, but to me, it is not really clear. Like, how do you take the, um, so where do you place like four sensors or just at the end of factor, like next to the gripper? And how you, do you transmit this haptic feedback on the shoulder? Like, how do you do this? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, first, uh, actually, uh, the seating work, you mean? In the, uh, so I, I noted it's slide 41. <laughs> if you want to take your presentation, it was in slide 41. Oh, because yeah. I saw that there was a sort of like, uh, not a cage, but there were, there were some, um, there was a, a white structure that was around the back. Right, right, right. And then right. something on, on the shoulder, but I couldn't figure out the detail of how you use this for transmitting the, like the haptic uh, feedback. I don't know where it is, if it, if it is located on one specific part or like it is on the entire structure, like it's not clear for me. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I did not explain uh, all the details. We designed this cage, you know, using yeah. uh, you know, some elastic, uh, you know, um, um, and for plastics and uh, fitting uh, his body very nicely. Uh, so uh, here's uh, some of the details here, which are not shown here. So the arms, uh, uh, robot arms, and are having the base over here, right? Which is connected to uh, this white structure. So, so you know, as uh, it uh, actually uh, pushed down this, you know, that is born by somewhere here, and which is actually transmitted here. We did not actually carefully design this, but uh, you know, you know, you know, he can recognize and aware. You know, left arms and holding how much in a force, and then you know, right arms and holding how much in force. That can be actually transmitted through this cage. Okay, and you have like four sensors somewhere. Uh, what sensor? Four sensors. Oh no, no, no. So that's a very, you know important point. This is basically you know not the kind of artificial you know uh, uh, haptic rendering. But the real pressure is felt. It's directly okay. 
you know, contact. So uh, th there's no artificial, you know, um, you know, signal processing is involved. Uh, this is the features of, of this, you know, uh, robot attached to the human body, right? Well, in fact, uh, you know, we're not actually, you know, looking at uh, certain points, but we vaguely, you know, see it uh, as kind of background information. And then that kind of haptics are checking all the time. So, in, you know, in fact, uh, you know, in case uh, this side is actually slipping, uh, not supporting it, um, although he is not you know, watching this part, but, you know, you know, he detects that through this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think uh, haptics uh, plays a very important uh, roles. Um, yeah, when we uh, uh, attach the uh, robot to, to our body, and uh, you know that's actually a feature. We're not talking about the robot sitting on the floor, right? <laughs> but it's actually attached to our body. Um, and then uh, the the kind of experimental result I just briefly talk about uh, that we shut down the other uh, stimuli, like uh, you know, um, you know, both. Uh, um, you know, we put the headphones here, not hearing anything, just purely looking at the, you know, haptic sense uh, at the back um, and then visual, you know, and then there's a very interesting, uh, you know, interesting uh, relationship between visions and haptics um, combined with the uh, manipulation task being on. on, on. This is also something that we know happens in the child development, the combination of visual and haptic. There are relationships yeah. saying like how they combine and how they, how they evolve with the development. Right, right, right. I, I, I listened to the, uh, your conversations uh, during the, some you know, uh, you know, panel discussions and uh, you talk about uh, some learning and stuff. Yeah, it, it is actually very much, you know, useful to uh, learn things from the, uh, um, yeah, the childhood development. And, uh, you know, uh, our brain is structured in such a way that uh, the haptics and then the kind of cognitive, you know, you know, heritable language things are going to the same part of the brain, right? So, you know, uh, co-stimulating that part, you know, that really makes sense. And then that's what we see, we observe uh, in our research too. Thank you. Sure. So thanks again for the nice and really interesting talk.